you guys, you just, you got to push. It's that last little stretch, right? That sprint right before the end. All right. So how can phylogenies be confusing? And the best way to answer this question is obviously by existing, right? If a phylogeny exists, if it presents itself, if it presents itself on a sheet of paper, it's going to be confusing, right? Um, hopefully that's not the case and we can go through and, and talk about, uh, basically use this as a way to discuss what bits of information can we gather from phylogenies and, and, and how can they be helpful. So I already mentioned this, it's been a little while, maybe 10 days since we last had class together, but as a reminder, the branch lengths on a phylogeny do not represent actual evolutionary time. Uh, therefore, what seems to be implied by the phylogeny is not true. There seems to be um, uh, different uh, amounts of time uh, represented on the phylogeny, uh, but that is, that is not the case. Also, uh, depending on how we construct our phylogeny, oftentimes we end up with sister groups that are very, very different, especially when we're trying to build a phylogeny that connects multiple phyla or a phylogeny that connects just even multiple classes within the same phylum. All right. So another reason why phylogenies can be confusing is... Every time a new feature appears on a phylogeny, uh, you have to assume that that feature continues unless it's otherwise noted. So unless it's otherwise noted, uh, every time you have a branch, a branching event, you do not lose any of the features uh, that came earlier uh, in, in your phylogeny. And so we'll see this uh, on an actual phylogeny. It'll start to make a little bit more sense. It'll take shape and uh, you'll, you'll have a good idea of what, what this means. A couple of terms that you need to be familiar with. First one is called a plesiomorphy, and I think I mentioned this last time, uh, but anyways, even if I didn't, I'm mentioning it now. Uh, when you have two separate branches, and they share some feature because they both got it from their ancestor, either that node that they share or one earlier, you call that a plesiomorphy, okay? It is, uh, they are shared characteristics that they both inherited from the ancestor. So if all mammals root back to a single common ancestor, what would be a plesiomorphy for rabbits and rats? Russell? Fur, right? That'd be something that the idea is they both got it from their shared ancestor. It's not something that appeared in both groups. That would be a shared feature that they both got from having the same ancestry, right? Both descend from that original furry mammal. Make sense? Okay. Wow. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough day, I think. It's okay. I've worked through many a tough day. All right. Now, shared derived features, so these are features that maybe every member of a single branch has, but no other branch has this feature. These are called synapomorphies, and these are the features that we use to know when a branching event has happened, okay? When a branching event happened. Now, let's do this. Assuming mammals and reptiles share a common ancestor, what could be a synapomorphy for mammals? Hair. How about fur, right? Let's not say hair, because hair has a very specific meaning, but let's say fur, right? Now it's something that's shared by all of the members of that branch, and it, it, it is one of the features that was actually used to split those branches, okay? Then it gets a little bit complicated because there's some evidence that some dinosaurs had fur, and then you're like, oh, what do we do with this? I don't know. But anyways, we can, we can work with that another time. And in that case, it's probably what you would call an analogous feature, that it developed in both those groups separately. Or that we're trying to connect groups that don't share ancestry anyways, and it's just kind of novel design elements. Anyways, another story for another time. So, again, we use these synapomorphies to know when we should branch, where we have a group that has some new feature. 
Okay, we use that to know where we should branch. You have to keep in mind that when you branch, one group gets that new feature. The other group tends to look more like the ancestor that did not have that feature, and it just it keeps on going, right? It tends to keep on living life. And so this, what this is explaining to you is nobody's, I shouldn't say nobody, very few people have a view of evolution in which one species evolves into another species and that original species ceases to exist, right? Where it's like species A evolves into species B, all of the members of species A become species B or just stop existing, okay? That's not anybody, that's not really anybody's view of evolution. The way it works is that species A, maybe some of the individuals split off and become species B and species A and species B both continue to exist. Make sense? You love that, right? You're like, not only does that make sense, Dr. Engel, but it enriched my day and brought me a joy like nothing else. You're welcome for that. Warmed my heart too, to see the smiles on your face. There we go, there are some smiles. All it takes is for me to say something that is completely untrue and you think that's <laughs> hilarious, right? It's like I give you I give you facts, nothing. I tell you something you know is a lie. I know is a lie. You're like, this is hilarious. I love this. I love it. He's lying to me, and it's just so good. It's just so good. Yeah. All right. So what I want you to do is this. I know we're we're pretty early into this little section, but we're gonna be taking some more frequent lecture breaks because we're dealing with material that's a little bit more theoretical. Okay? It's a little bit different than saying like okay, well, let's deal with plants. And you're like, I don't really think all that much about plants, but I've eaten them, right? So I have a sense of what they're like. This is a little bit more theoretical, so we'll take more frequent lecture breaks. And what I want you to do is this. I want you to take about a minute to 90 seconds, and I want you to come, come up with some examples of phylogenies we've had in this class, where we ended up with two branches side by side on a phylogeny, and those two branches were incredibly different. We had two sister taxa that were just incredibly different. Okay, think about, think about some of the phylogenies you've seen so far. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully you won't have to think all that hard to remember some of the phylogenies you had to know for exam three, but I understand knowledge is, it's like carbon 14, it's got a half-life, right? If you don't keep adding more, right, it just, it disappears. It's the reality of how things work. Um, yeah, so take about 60 to 90 seconds. Come up with an example of sister taxa that are very, very different. All right? 60 to 90 seconds, starting now. <laughs> you did say what I thought you said. I was like, that can't be... What I thought she said, but no, she, yeah. Sure enough. I don't think anybody with, I don't think anybody is that careless with such an expensive yeah. job. It's very expensive. Or use this one, yeah. or use one we've seen in the class so far. All right, all right. Anybody have some examples? I know I put one up on the board, but you all have been thinking about your own examples. <laughs> Levi. I found this hard because I don't know any, any tax by memory. Oh, you, you do. They're there somewhere. You just got to get the... Sh sometimes you got to get the shovel out and you start unearthing things you had forgotten were there all along, right? It's like when you bury your hamster that died in your backyard and you totally forgot you had done that, and then you're going to bury your dog that died and you dig up the hamster, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, can I bury these in the same hole? That seems weird. Let's find a new hole for the dog. 
That was no one's story? Oh my goodness, I'm alone? Oh man, anyways. All right, so how about, you know, where we've got a phylogeny that includes protostomes and deuterostomes. We end up with things like echinoderms and chordates right next to each other on a phylogeny, and morphologically, they are super duper different, right? I should say, we are super duper different because we are a chordate, right? There are sister taxa that are super duper different. Or your lophotrochozoan protostomes. What are some lophotrochozoan, wow, lophotrochozoan, you're like, if he can't say it, why do we need to know it? What are some lophotrochozoan phyla? Annelids, good. Mollus, flatworms, and it's like all three of these is just like a massive polytomy along with seven or eight other phyla, and they, they all look so different. They're just all these sister taxa together. Plus, when you got a polytomy going on, there are a whole bunch of sisters. Like, they're all just sister taxa. Like, why aren't they brother taxa? Because nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. It's all about the sisters, right? Sisters, they're the limiting factor. They're the ones that people pay you money for, right? The, the sons, it's just like, we don't care. Like, just go away. Uh, sorry, another story. Uh, so here's a phylogeny in which you basically have a representative of five different major groups of vertebrates, okay? Actually, not a major group of vertebrates because this isn't even a vertebrate. This is an invertebrate. Five major groups, one that I also can't count because it is five groups of vertebrates. This is a six, which is not a vertebrate. Anyway, six major groups of chordates. Let's go with that. Sorry, it's Monday, counting on Monday. It's interesting. So we end up with lizards and rabbits being, a, being sister taxa. Those are sister taxa that are pretty different, right? Both delicious, but pretty different as far as morph morphology is concerned, okay? Also on this, we can take a look and see this whole synapomorphy versus plesiomorphy issue, okay? So hair is a synapomorphy for rabbits because it's something rabbits have that no other group has, right? Do you agree? And it's what helped us to actually branch rabbits away from lizards. Now then we go egg with an amnion. This would be a synapomorphy for this entire clade here. That includes rabbits and lizards. It'd be for this branch, which then splits. Okay? So egg with amnion is a synapomorphy for this branch. Okay? Because it's present in this branch, but in no others. Right? And then we look here, and legs. Legs would be a synapomorphy for this branch because it's present in here and no others, okay? And then hinge jaw would be a synapomorphy for this branch because it's present in this branch and no others. Now, this branch further branches, and this is why you have to assume that this synapomorphy continues every time you branch unless you're, you're told otherwise, okay? Right? Yeah. yeah, Mika. So just to confirm, so that means a rabbit has a, like the hinge jaw, the legs, and the amnion. Oh, it does. So. Yep, absolutely. You would infer that unless you were told otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the synapomorphy you're given is the loss of a feature. Mm -hmm. You see this a lot with phylogenies that include parasitic groups because the parasites tend to lose a lot of features as they take on that lifestyle. And so a lot of times your synapomorphies for parasitic groups are loss of certain features, like loss of the digestive system, loss of the nervous system, loss of various other structures. Yeah, awesome. Um, I mean, I mean, if you if you if you want to argue that, but yeah, I mean, structurally, it's just a unshelled egg that's retained inside the uterus. So, all right? But you could say, like, the loss of a shell. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyways, that would be tough, though, because there are several lizards that give live birth as well, lizard species, and they don't form shells. Anyways, okay, so let's do this. So we've got synapomorphy figured out, right? You're like, I totally got this whole synapomorphy thing. I never knew what it was before. Now I know, and I'm enlightened, renewed even, okay? Now we need to get the plesiomorphy 
thing worked out. Okay, so if, if this is our branch in question, okay, this is our branch, give me a plesiomorphy. So synapomorphy is going to be something found in this branch that's found in no other branches, shared among all the members of this branch. A plesiomorphy is something that's found in every member of this branch, of this, uh, every member, yeah, every individual in this branch, but it's an ancestral trait. So for this branch right here, what is a plesiomorphy? Well, the egg with amnion is the synapomorphy that separated this branch from the rest. Let's go a little bit, a little bit further back. Legs. So legs would be a plesiomorphy for this branch, even though it was a synapomorphy for this branch. <laughs> right? It was a synapomorphy for this branch because it's what separated this branch from the ancestral group, right? Fish don't have legs. Do you agree? Yeah. Cool. So then <laughs> legs would be a synapomorphy for this branch present in these descendants. Frogs have legs, unless they don't. Lizards have legs, unless they don't. There are some legless lizards. And then rabbits have legs, unless you remove them to make stew, right? <laughs> And so legs is a synapomorphy for this branch here. It separated this group from the ancestral group in which it came from. Yes? But then all of these members still have a hinged jaw, right? Yeah. So these three members still have a hinged jaw, right? Rabbits have a hinged jaw. Lizards have a hinged jaw. Frogs have a hinged jaw. But that wasn't something that split this branch apart from all other branches. It's something that they just inherited from an ancestor further away. Let's think about it this way. So last names tend to work this way, right? So your last name tends to have been inherited from your father and then he inherited it from his father, so on and so forth. But last names can work this way, right? Where you can say you have, you know, for most of us, if you're anything like me, the crazy side of your family is your dad's side, okay? Your mom's side is a little bit more stable. Anyways, that's my, that's my reality. And so I like to think a lot of my features, my features of stability come from my mother's side, right? And so this would be a plesiomorphy for my family, for my nuclear family. It's a plesiomorphy, okay? But then the synapomorphy is something like I inherited my father's last name but not his craziness. My dad's actually pretty okay, but it's his family. That's just, who all tend to bear the same last name. Okay? That wasn't really that great of an analogy. But anyways, um, the synapomorphy plesiomorphy thing. So every plesiomorphy was at some point a synapomorphy. Every plesiomorphy was at some point a, a synapomorphy if you go far enough back. But not all synapomorphies will become plesiomorphies. <laughs> well, that one was good. That one was much better than the other analogy. All right? So plesiomorphy, synapomorphy, don't you fret. We'll, we'll practice this some more. Yeah, and you'll love it. Okay. All right, any questions about this question? And remember this question started with, how can phylogenies be confusing? And you're like, all you did with this slide, Dr. Engel, is make me hate phylogenies even more. You're welcome. All right, next question. How does phylogenetics differ from taxonomy? So phylogenetics is an effort to name organisms just based on their evolutionary history. So how are these different? Well, both of them uh, try to arrange groups according to increasing exclusivity. Okay, so you start with groups that are very inclusive, like phyla, right? Includes a lot of individuals. And then you start to get to, towards groups that are more and more exclusive. Start weeding out further and further and further uh, amounts of your variation. Right? And in taxonomy, eventually you get to the level of species and you've weeded out every member of that phylum that is not part of that species. 
or every member of that kingdom that is not part of that species, right? Make sense? Well, we do that with phylogenies as well. That's why we're branching. That's why we're taking a really big branch and we're branching it into smaller branches because we're trying to accomplish the same thing. Build groups that are more and more exclusive so that these groups are actually <coughs> very meaningful. When you have a group that contains everybody, it's not really meaningful, right? It's like having a club on campus that everybody's a part of. Like, it's not a club. That's the student body, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, now, phylogenetics only uses groups that are monophyletic. And what this means is it has to include the ancestor and all of the descendants of that ancestor. We've talked about this before when we asked the question, why is the class Reptilia so confusing? Right? Do you remember that? It was all the way back on exam three, like two weeks ago. And the, 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 the issue there is Reptilia is not monophyletic unless you include all of the descendants of that group, which forces you to put which group as part of Reptilia? Not mammals. Mammals, we've eliminated that by moving Reptilia later, right? saying reptiles didn't start until after the break of diapsid synapsid. But you have to put birds in, right? If you put birds in there, now reptilia is monophyletic. It includes the ancestor and all of the descendants of that ancestor. If you move reptilia earlier, then you'd have to include mammals as well. But we tend to move it until after the break of synapsids and diapsids. All these terms, they're coming back to you, right? Like, it's like, you know... Remembering that I love pumpkin, you know, I don't eat it all year long and then I don't, I mean, it just comes back and it's like immediately I love it again. Unless you don't, then you're just, your life is missing something. If you're allergic to pumpkin, I'm sorry. Not because I offended you, but because, wow, well, your life is just really missing something. Um, taxonomy, on the other hand, developed by Linnaeus... Uh, it allows for paraphyletic groups. So this is where some of the ancestors would, would be categorized in a different group. It's the same thing that we talked about with apes and humans, right? Where you've got Pongidae, which traditionally included chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, um, and then would have also included likely the ancestors shared by chimpanzees and humans, if of course humans and chimpanzees share an ancestor which I don't think they do, but if they did, it would be in that family as well. Now we have that family Pongidae is paraphyletic. Some of the ancestors of that group are outside of that group. No big deal for taxonomy. No big deal. You're like, it doesn't matter because we're, we're grouping things based on shared features, not based on evolutionary trajectory. In phylogenetics, that's a big issue because it is, it is not a representation of the way the evolution would have progressed. Okay, so then what do we do? What do we do? How do we resolve that issue? Going back to exam three, how do we resolve the pungity hominity issue? What did we do? You get rid of pungity and put all of those all of those species in hominity, and then now you don't have pungity because it was paraphyletic and useless, and we only have hominity, which is now monophyletic. Includes the ancestor and all the descendants of that ancestor. Okay? Okay. Now, neither classification scheme allows for what are called polyphyletic groups. Polyphyletic groups means you have multiple ancestries among the members of your group. Multiple ancestries. So basically, you have multiple members of this group that came from ancestors outside the group. Why do you think both schemes, or schema, I think is actually the correct way. Uh, why do you think both of these strategies reject polyphyletic groups? Yeah. Well, it starts to, yeah, I mean, it starts to allow you to be comfortable saying that there are multiple ancestries, Right. And then so it's like, well, if you'll do it for this group, why wouldn't you do it for all living forms? And to say that there are multiple ancestries for all living forms. 
which smells a lot like a creationist perspective of origins. Okay? Which, I, yeah, I don't know if you should have a problem with. All right. Yeah. Yes, a creationist perspective. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Where all living forms give you an, an issue where you have multiple ancestries. But any polyphyletic group, I mean, it could be a small group. It could be a group that just contained, you know, two classes in an entire phylum. As long as those two classes had separate ancestries or ancestors that would have been outside of whatever that grouping is. Polyphyletic groups, it's hard to find examples of these because everybody basically rejects this type of grouping. Like, let's say you wanted to group all of your segmented phyla and put them into a group called, I don't know, segmented group, right? I don't even know what you would call it. If you were to try to do that, that would be a polyphyletic group, right? Because all three of our major segmented phyla come from completely different origins. Does that make sense? Okay. Even if it doesn't, I mean, I, I'll have no idea until you take your test, unless you come and meet with me. So, um, so here's just typical taxonomy, okay? Typical taxonomy, where we are trying to get to more and more exclusive groups, okay? We're starting with a very inclusive group that includes all eukaryotes, then we moved to kingdom animalia, and so now we've excluded all fungi and plants and that weird junk drawer that we call protus, right? And then we go to cho chordates, and we've eliminated annelids and arthropods and mollusks, right? Everything that isn't a chordate. And then we go to mammals, and we've eliminated reptiles and birds and frogs and fishes, right? And even the, the lancelids and tunicates, the weird chordates. And then we go to carnivora, and we've eliminated bats and rats and primates and cetaceans, the whales, right? And then we go to canidae, and we've eliminated cats and weasels and skunks and other members of family canidae. Oh, otters are in the, oh, otters are part of the weasel family. Anyway, sorry. Um, and then we go to genus canis, and we've eliminated foxes and... Oh, I can't think of any other dogs that are outside of this genus. Anyways, and then we go to Canis lupus, and now we've eliminated everything that isn't a wolf or a domesticated duck. <coughs> okay? <sighs> okay, so that's traditional taxonomy. Okay, again, we're moving to more and more exclusive groups. Now, here's um, uh, another, another look at this. Typical taxonomic levels, but now showing you that as we move this way, we get an increasing level of diversity because we are aiming towards getting more and more exclusive groups. But you're really trying to do this whether you're doing taxonomy or you're doing phylogenetics. The biggest difference is what? If you're doing phylogenetics, what do you have to reject? Any group that would leave some of the descendants outside of that group. We call that a paraphyletic grouping. And then phylogenetics, you're like, that requires phylogenetic trees. I don't like phylogenetic trees. So that's another difference. Nobody really likes phylogenetic trees, but man, they are useful. They are useful. I was trying to think of another example. I, I, can't, I can't think of one. Yeah, anyways, it'll come to me. All right. When you're building phylogenies, you have to use shared features. And we have two different types of shared features. What are they? There are shared ancestral features. And what do we call those? Plesiomorphy, shared ancestral feature, plesiomorphy. And then you have shared derived features that are called what? Synapomorphy. Both of those are shared because of the same ancestry. Both of those fall under the umbrella of homologous structures. But then we have other structures that look like they might be due to shared ancestry, but, but can't be attached. So the question is, how do we tell the difference? Well, some of it we assume, but we do have some rules. 
One, if it develops in the same way. So if you have a structure that looks the same and develops the same, there's a good probability that, that, that those two features are homologous. If they develop in the same way and they serve the same function, there's a pretty good chance that they actually developed from the same ancestor or were designed by the same designer. If it's structured in the same way and carries out the exact same function, it's probably homologous. If the gene that controls the development of the structure or the construction of the structure is on the same place, on the same chromosome, it's probably homologous. And then, if it's better explained by convergence, it's probably not homologous, but it's analogous. And what we mean by this, if it's better explained because both groups of organisms needed this in their environment, it's probably better explained as an analogous feature and not as homologous. If the organisms do share ancestry, especially in the case where we can actually map this out or have seen this happen, uh, then it's likely a homologous structure. So basically to answer this question, how can you tell if the feature is homologous or analogous? We need to know how does it develop, when does it develop, and where are the genes that control the development? All right, we're going to take another lecture break, and what I want you to do is this. I want you to take a couple of minutes working with those around you, and I want you to come up with a list of five homologies and five analogies. So five structures that are very likely derived from the same ancestry, and then five structures that look very similar, maybe even carry out a similar function, but are very likely not derived from common ancestry. All right, take two minutes, starting now. Got about 30 seconds. Five homologies, five analogies. Man, if only there were an assessment coming up in order to determine whether or not you could actually replicate this. Hmm. All right, so what do we got? What are some homologies? Cameron. What, what about in bats? Are you wanting to go echolocation in bats and dolphins? Okay. That's an analogy, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's why you stopped her. Okay, echolocation in bats and dolphins. Yeah, that would likely not be a homologous uh, structure for a number of reasons. But yeah, it's a great example of one of our analogies. What are some homologies? 
Okay, so give me an example. Okay. <laughs> Your dog has legs. So you say that that's very likely it's from the same ancestry. Okay. Joe. Things with eyes. What kind of eyes? Let's get a little bit more descriptive here. Are you talking about just any eyes? Like insect eyes, human eyes? You're talking about like vertebrate eyes. You know what's interesting is, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's fine. If, if, if Developing the eye is very complicated, and having to do it more than once, unless you have a designer creating it multiple times, is super challenging. But here's, here's what's interesting, is it's also a great example of an analogy, because the eyes in squid and octopi and nautiluses are very, very similar to human eyes. Very similar. And so it's a good example of both a homology and an analogy. Because if, it, if it's a homology for mollusks and for vertebrates, what does that mean? If it's, a homo, if, it's a, if it's a homology, it means it came from shared ancestry, right? What's the most recent common ancestor between mollusks and vertebrates? If it existed, it would have been your original bilaterally symmetrical animal. That would have been, that, that is your most recent common ancestor. And then you're like, wow, we've got a lot of groups that lost that eye. But it's so awesome. Why would you lose it? Unless, of course, you shot it out by throwing a bullet into a fire. That's, no, none, of you, none of you know people that have done that? Oh, man. So I got to tell you this story. It really has nothing to do with this class. But one of the deacons in my church, when he was five years old... <laughs> When he was five, listen, not now. When he was five, he was throwing bullets into a fire. And it was working great for like the first five. But number six shot him right in the eye. And it didn't generate enough velocity to actually penetrate very far. But anyways, he lost his eye. And so he's got a fake eye now. And he teaches in the kids' ministry. And, and the kids can get him to like take his eye out. And it's, they love it. They're just like, they're like, Mr. Bull, can you take your eye out? And then they, they like, they want to hold it. And they, they, yeah, I mean, they just, anyways. But, but that's, not, that's not the best part of the story. The best part of the story is my nephew is one of those kids, and he's fascinated by it. Every time he sees, every time he sees Mr. Bull, he wants to see, he wants to see his eye. And so his name is Greg, Greg Bull. Anyways, so my nephew had a stuffed, had like a stuffed leopard and its name was Oreo. And so like one of his good friends gave it to him right before he changed school. So it, it was important to him and Oreo lost an eye. I don't know how it happened. I didn't ask for the details, but when Oreo lost his eye, my nephew changed its name from Oreo to Greg. <laughs> In tribute, of course, to Mr. Bull. Oh, man, that is good stuff. So now he has Greg, his one-eyed leopard. All right. Some more homologies. Yeah, Tara. Okay, closed versus open circulatory system. That's the one like eyes where you can use it as a homology in some places, but you'd have to use it as an analogy in, in others, especially with the open circulatory systems. Because we find open circulatory systems in arthropods, and you find in some arthropods, in almost all arthropods, and you find it in some mollusks as well. But then your annelids have a closed circulatory system, so it gets a little bit interesting. So that's one where you can use it as both a homology, if you're talking about some groups, or an analogy in others. Good. Any other? We'll do one more homology, and then we'll transition over to analogies. Mika. Wings. So wings in, as a homology, so wings in birds, right? All birds have wings because they descended from a winged ancestor. But wings is another one where you could use it as analogies. So here's uh, wings in birds and wings in bats, uh, very likely homologous structures if, of course, all of these came from the same vertebrate ancestors, just modifications of the same bones. But now when we start pulling in insects, this would be something that would be a great example of an analogous, analogous structure, okay? The wings in insects 
are really just an extension of their exoskeleton. There's no skeletal support for it. I mean, underlying inside internal skeletal support. It's just an extension of that external covering. Good. Any other ideas of some analogies? Yeah, Allison. Yeah, you sure do. But, yeah, so fur or fur-like structures, yeah, very, very, very good example of an analogy. And then it looks like there were dinosaur. There were some dinosaurs that had fur, and you just, like, it's an analogous structure. Yeah. We are doing analogies now. Do you want to do echolocation in bats and dolphins? Okay. Do you have one, Levi? Okay. Any other? We'll do one more analogy. How about bipedalism? Bipedalism walking upright, right? Bipedalism in kangaroos versus humans. Okay. An analogy. Yeah, Levi. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> matching. Well, I mean, it's actually a good, it's a good point because animals tend to match whatever the color of their environment is, regardless of their ancestry, right? If it's an insect, it's going to do better if it matches the color of its environment. If it's a fish, it's going to do better if it matches the color of its environment. You know what's cool is fish tend to be dark colored on top so that when you look at them from above, they blend in with the bottom, and then they tend to be lightly colored on the bottom so when you look at them from below, they look like the background. And you know what's actually kind of cool is you can, if you've got a deck and you've got an insect problem, if you paint the roof of the deck to look like the sky or very lightly colored, a lot of the insects will avoid it, at least during the daytime, because it, they feel more exposed. Anyways, all right. Now, uh, this, this question, this may be the last one we deal with today. Who knows? The future will tell. How should we actually build phylogenetic trees? How should we actually build phylogenetic trees? We talked a little bit about this already. The last time we met together, we talked about what do you need to build phylogenetic trees? And we talked about that you need an outgroup, right? So you have to assume the ancestry of your group. But remember that like taxonomy, the goal of phylogenies or phylogenetics is to get to ever increasingly exclusive groups, right? To start with a group that basically includes everybody and keep branching it to get to a more and more exclusive groups. Remember also that we're trying to illustrate relationships. When we're building phylogenetic trees, we're trying to demonstrate which branches are more closely related than others. You have to try to strike a balance between readability and accuracy. And this one, like if you wanted to build a phylogeny of all animals, right? Assuming that all animals root back to a single animal ancestor and you wanted to represent that in a phylogeny. It's a lot of species. I think there are presently about 1.7 million described animal species. If you wanted to put all of those on a phylogeny, that's gonna be a very, very intense phylogeny. It's not going to be very readable, right? Which is why those tend to be just at the phylum level when we're trying to put all animals back to a single ancestor. Tend to do it at the level of the phylum. But you have to try to strike that balance. So molecular data are helpful when you're building phylogenies. Molecular data are like the sequences, the, the DNA sequence, the RNA sequence, the amino acid sequence in a protein. These provide a more objective picture because you don't, have to, you don't have to make the decision of which characteristics would be harder to develop than others, right? which you have to do when you're using morphological features. <coughs> this is limited to organisms with DNA, RNA, or protein samples. So this is very challenging to use molecular data when you're trying to build phylogenies that include extinct forms. Right? Make sense? Maybe. Um, it also assumes that mutation rates are constant. It assumes that the rate in which your DNA sequences change remains the same at all times in all lineages and in all genes. 
But I will tell you, we know this is not true. We'll see this a lot next semester in cell biology. Those of you that continue into cell biology, uh, you'll see this, that mutation rates are not constant. They're not constant among various groups of living organisms, and they are certainly not constant within a single genome. There are what you call mutation hotspots, places in the genome that mutate much more rapidly than others. So this is subject to inconsistencies. Again, some genes are going to mutate more quickly than others. Now, morphological data, they're easier to work with, provide an easier picture. However, they are limited to organisms we have studied. So you have to know the organism well enough to know what would be a difficult feature to develop. What would be a difficult feature uh, to evolve? And then they are always going to assume homology. If two organisms share a particular feature, it's always going to assume it's that they share this feature because they both got it from the same ancestor. But then we have examples of analogous features. Uh, heavily subject to bias as you try to make decisions of what would be more complicated, what would be more likely to actually develop. All right, we're going to do one more lecture break. What I want you to do is this. I want you to take a couple of minutes working with those around you, and I want you to figure out a way in which you, would, you could build the absolute best tree possible. Like if you were given some hypothetical task on some hypothetical assessment to describe how you, would be, how you could build the best phylogenetic tree possible, what data would you use? How many groups would you include? What kind of organisms would you look to for your outgroup? Just from the ground up, if you were going to build the best phylogenetic tree possible, okay, how would you do it? Take a couple of minutes, work with those around you, and come up with an answer to that question. Got about 30 seconds. So if you were going to build, or if you were tasked with building the best phylogeny possible, how would you do it? What data would you use? Levi. We said that we would build a phylogeny that isn't based on um, things that you necessarily have evolved from each other. Okay. So it would be like the trees, trees the most nuanced phylogeny. Okay, so you would, you would build a phylogeny where you aren't assuming shared ancestry. <clears throat> Bless you. When it makes sense, you'll put them together. Yeah. When it doesn't make sense, you won't force it. Just, just group an organism into categories for study. Versus yep. 
And so what you get when you do that, uh, so you, you, have you all heard what's called the tree of life, right? Where it's an attempt to represent all living organisms and their evolutionary descent from a original ancestor. The creationist response to that is often what's called the orchard of life, where you have multiple different ancestries, multiple special independent individual creations that then have diversified through time to include some other you know, species and to include some reproductively isolated groups, right? And that's really what we mean by various species is reproductively isolated groups. They still descended from the same ancestor, but they no longer reproduce. Yeah. Any other ideas, Micah? Um, along those lines, no polytomies. No polytomies, um, right? So if you've got a phylogeny with a polytomy, you throw it out, start over, right? Use different data or add more data until you can eliminate the polytomies. Yeah, that idea, if it doesn't make sense, then of course. Yeah. Right, so that may actually help you to know where it should be a separate tree altogether. Right where your orchard should add another tree is when you've got unresolved polytomies that even when you add more and more data, the picture gets muddier and muddier, right? Because if they really do share ancestry, the more data you add, the better you should be able to explain that variation. If they don't and you're trying to force it, the more data you add, the more complicated it's going to get, the uglier your polytomy gets. Yeah, what else? Any other ideas on what we could use for data? How many groups? I would suggest you should probably not ever try to connect more than 10 groups at a time. Otherwise, it makes your phylogeny just way too complicated. And that you should build your phylogeny using both molecular and morphological data. Using molecular and morphological data. All right, here are a couple of figures from your text that show different phylogenies and different ways in which we can group the organisms and we will continue in chapter 20 on Wednesday. All right, have a wonderful conclusion to your Monday.